Let's go. Let's go. Oh, no. Do you want to? Sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you. Next one. I'm excited and I feel relaxed and I'm ready to party. Don't say sorry. You don't need to do that. You don't need to apologize. It's a fucked up female habit. You don't need to be sorry for anything ever. Can you guess what every woman's worst nightmare is? I don't have rage issues! I have nothing to prove to you. When I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. I say when it comes to stardom and Lauren, there are no accidents. Hi, Karen Peterson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Citizen Dame. We are back, and we are excited to be talking about fun things, fun movie things yet again. I am Lauren Humphreys-Brooks, and with me, as always, is Karen Peterson. Hello, Karen. Hello. One of these days, I'm going to do the like the Wayne's World intro just completely on accident, and it's, <laughs> it's going to be hilarious. <laughs> that would be all right. I'd be okay with that. <laughs> How are you doing, Karen? <laughs> Oh, I'm doing okay. Doing all right. How are you? Not bad. Not bad. I as as I was saying before we started recording, the um the time change has kind of screwed me up a little bit. Uh, but other other than that, just fine. I just have decided that I don't sleep anymore. That I just <laughs> go to bed really really late and still wake up at my normal time, and that's okay apparently. <laughs> yeah, so fun. <laughs> I on the other hand have been going to bed at like seven o'clock and waking up about the time that you're going to bed i guess <laughs> stupid goddamn daylight savings time yeah i'm so messed up like but my messed up is weird is different from yours like you're going to bed late i'm going to bed really early but then not being able to sleep all night it's weird it's i time. don't understand it <laughs> it's time to end this it's time yes we like... need to make daylight saving time the new standard time so we just stay on it forever yes i like the because i like when the the days are longer in the summer you know i like that yeah exactly exactly i don't care i i I still never i i still don't understand why we do it anymore but um there you go yeah uh i know why we did but i don't know why we still do it well and a lot of people have talked about how it's very archaic like it's Mm -hmm. there isn't much of an argument for it anymore and there even some i mean there's some places that don't do it Right. Um, and which which screws up their relationship with the rest of the country because everyone's like, wait, what time is it? Yeah. Um, well, California actually had voted to end the switch and stay on permanent daylight saving time. But uh, Congress had to approve that. And they were like, um, California would just mess it up for everybody. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> just Congress, stop controlling our time. You control everything else. Fuck my well, life. What happened God. to states' rights, Republicans? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Anyways, I, I know it yeah. was always weird when I lived in Britain um, because British British chain changeover was always different from the American changeover. So there would be a period where I would be like, um, I think it was like six or seven hours difference instead of five and it was very strange it was Mm -hmm. always like i never knew when anyone was awake or when anyone was asleep um (laughs) so this week uh marks the beginning of our first november episode which i am excited about because we go straight from spooky season to film noir and those are two of my favorite genres although again as we've discussed in in the past is noir a genre no not really it's more of a it's more of a vibe. It's more of a mm-hmm. feeling. It's like that's a noir. Why? I don't know. <laughs> it just is. It just feels like it is. Um, and I think that's something we could talk about with the three films that we've chosen um, for today, because we want to talk a little bit about Barbara Stanwyck. Um, and we've covered various films uh, that Barbara Stanwyck made on this podcast before, but we've never actually really talked about her as an actress um and and she is kind of one of the quintessential actresses really of that era of hollywood and very much a quintessential noir actress um which is interesting because if you really look at her filmography she she kind of ran the gamut she pretty much did every genre um for a long time she was she was known for screwball comedy she was very much like the pre-code girl um in in the in the early days uh she did a whole bunch of westerns particularly later on in her career and and as we know she did television um so she had like 
a huge, she has a huge filmography and she has like a huge scope of, of the kind of films that she did. And she's great in all of them. And I think that's one of the things that is amazing about her is that she always anchors a film. It doesn't matter what role she's playing, um, whether she's being really, you know, dramatic, whether she is like really sympathetic, whether she is the most hateful person on the planet. Um, she's always like this very powerful presence on the screen. So just to give a little bit of background about her, um, she was born in Brooklyn in on July 16th, 1907, and was born as Ruby Catherine Stevens, <laughs> uh, and then eventually became uh, Barbara Stanwyck. But she was orphaned at the age of four after her mother died from complications of a miscarriage, and her father went off to dig the Panama Canal and was never seen again. So she pretty much grew up in foster homes for, for most of her life and then was more or less like financially independent from the time she was about uh, 14 or 15 years old. And eventually she became a Ziegfeld girl <laughs> in the 1920s. And this led her eventually into, into acting. But this was a woman who was like working constantly from the time she was a child. And her reputation in Hollywood was that she worked constantly. She never stopped, which I think is very much reflected in her career. She, you know, she made films and TV shows like all throughout her life. I think one of her biggest um, final roles was in the Big Valley, where she's like the matriarch of this big Western family. Um, but so she was present and working for a very, very long time. Before we get into talking about the, the specific films that we want to discuss today, Karen, if you had to say, like, this is my favorite Barbara Stanwyck film, what what film would it be? Oh, I was not prepared for that question. <laughs> um, I just, sorry, I just kind of <laughs> threw that one at you. But but just it does like it does. It can be one of the films that we're talking about, like if you want to just use that. <laughs> but I was just interested, like if if there's a particular performance of hers that you really like. I mean, gosh, there's. You know, he, she had such a, a great career. I mean, I do love, um, I love her performance in Sorry, Wrong Number, which we're talking about today. But I, I think probably Double Indemnity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Think, which we're not talking about, but I think that's probably my favorite. And she's fantastic in it. She she does such a good job of, one of the things I, I like about it, and all of the films that we're talking about today, I think, strike this balance where she can be very tough, but also very sympathetic. Mm -hmm. And she she kind of gets at the, even when she's playing characters that for a different actress would not be sympathetic at all, you still get the sense that these are like full human beings, that that her her performances really rely on that. And so it's something like Double Indemnity, where she's villainous in a lot of ways she's a femme fatale right but you get that undercurrent of um how she's kind of been used her entire life and she's sort of trying to get some of her own back so it isn't just pure villainy there's something more underlying it yeah yeah i would agree with that um my my personal favorite is the lady eve i i will say that one of her screwball comedies which we've talked about before yeah uh, that's a good one too and I just think she's great in that. She is so funny. And and also, and she's just so hot. Like in that movie, you're just like, Henry Fonda doesn't stand a chance. <laughs> like the second, the, sh the second she clocks him, you're just like, and she's like, that's the guy. That's the guy I'm going to get. And you're just like, he's he's done. Like within the first five minutes of the film, he's done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty true for any man that stars in a movie with her. So that's true. That's true. Like she, the ball of fire is another one. She's great with Gary Cooper, but again, she very much clocks him. She's just like, yep, that's it. All right. <laughs> that's the guy. He's an idiot. And I love him. <laughs> uh, which I quite enjoy, but she, her delivery of the line. Um, I need him like the ax needs the Turkey in oh, yeah. uh, the lady Eve is just, is first of all, so inappropriately sexual <laughs> and, and so funny and also so like yeah he's he's done like whatever she wants to do she's gonna win pretty much <laughs> uh, uh, she's so great it's crazy because she was nominated for four oscars but she never won which is uh, more of a reflection on the oscars i think than on yes. her 
We also have yeah. to remember there are so many actresses and actors and directors who never won Oscars. Oh yeah, and, totally. And are and are better remembered very often than the actual like people who won the Oscar the same year they were nominated. Mm-hmm. Um, and I yeah. mean, Stan Stanwyck is just such a dependable actress. Yeah, you know it's interesting because I was, you know, it's one of those things when I see oh, okay this person was nominated but they lost who did they lose to and then I look and so for example Double Indemnity she was nominated. Um, the other nominees were Ingrid Bergman for Gaslight who won, uh, Betty Davis for Mister Skeffington, Claudette Colbert since you went away and Greer Garson for Mrs. Parkington. So it's like one of those categories where a couple of those movies, it's like, yeah, I don't, I've never seen those. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I'd never heard of Mrs. Parkington um, and Gaslight. It's like, oh, Gaslight or Double Indemnity. Oh, that is a good matchup. <laughs> anyway, it's just fun yeah, it's to, to look at that. Mm-hmm. My Oscar nerd coming out. So for the the three films that we're going to talk about today, and um, and actually it's funny because we're we're doing noir November, and now that I look at this list, I'm like, are any of these really noir? Uh, kind of. I I think that definitely definitely one of them qualifies, and the other two I think you can make an argument for. Um, yeah. But the three films we're going to talk about today, and again, as always, we are going to talk about most of the the plots of these. So you know, if you haven't seen them, or if you want to remain unspoiled, um, you know, come back come back later. Uh, they are all available on various streaming platforms, which we'll let you know about as we talk about them. So the first one we want to talk about is uh, Babyface from 1933. And this film is notorious. In, in fact, I, I think that I've seen some, you know, there are a lot of different films that just say, oh, this is the reason for the code, or that is the reason for the code. This film, you're kind of like, this could not have been made two years later. Like this would never have been have happened. And it certainly wouldn't end the way that it does. In fact, um, from what I was reading up on this, uh, this film in particular is a big reason why they were so insistent on um, enforcing the code, <laughs> which is understandable. I mean, the code was wrong, but it's like, oh, yeah, I could see how that happened. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it's it's surprising. It's surprising in, in part because it's so late. It's 1933, right? Mm-hmm. So this is like right on the cusp, basically, of the code really getting hammered home and it becoming impossible to make films like this, essentially. Yeah. And certainly not not to make them as explicitly as they do here. So the the film, basically, it features Barbara Sandwick as uh, Lily Powers, who starts out life working for her father, essentially being pimped out by her father in, in a speakeasy. And it charts her rise from being this girl in speakeasy to uh, coming to, to essentially like seducing bank presidents and things like that as she kind of moves up the, the corporate ladder by sleeping with a multitude of men. Um, And the whole thing really starts out with her friendship with a professor who introduces her to Nietzsche uh, and kind of encourages her to just like discard sentiment and and only live for what she can get out of people. And it's a film that 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 whole ethos could be could feel very nihilistic um and very much condemn in a lot of ways the the lead character but it really doesn't it treats her with a great deal of sympathy and understanding and it is kind of exploring these these issues of sexual dynamics and the fact that she has no power other than her sexuality that's the only thing that she can really have control over and even then men are constantly trying to take that control away from her um so what are your opening thoughts about this this film Karen. I had actually never seen it before and it was um it was one of those where it's like I knew about it but I didn't really know about it you know so I, I wasn't sure what I was um what I was sitting down to watch until I started it and I I was immediately I mean Barbara Stanwyck is just such a such a presence that it's it's hard not to be immediately drawn in by her and I was so surprised by how blunt it is about the experiences that she's had from the time she was 14 years old as she's you know yelling at her father right before he dies. And then just how open it is throughout about her sexuality and her willingness to use that. Uh, I, I think 
you know, especially, I mean, we were just talking about the code, like for the time period, it was, it's very, um, it's very honest and straightforward in a lot of ways. And I, it's, I wish that, you know, I mean, like I just said, the code, the code was terrible and it's because of movies like this, like if just think about where we would be now, if movies like this hadn't been censored and had been allowed to, to exist and, Mm -hmm. and to, be part of our culture there's so many so many conversations that could have happened decades before you know if we if movies like this had been allowed to be made um into the the 30s 40s 50s instead of trying to suppress all of it Mm -hmm. barbara stanwick is great um i do think that there's there's just um there's so much interesting uh it's such an interesting movie because like you say um she uh, even as men are trying to take her power away she it's the one thing that she knows how to wield um because and i'm not saying that it's a good thing but because of the experiences that she had with her father and because of what he did to her like he basically in a weird messed up twisted way set her up to be able to handle herself as she got on later in life um Mm -hmm. as she grew up so it's it's really messed up and sh- and the experiences that she has never should have had to happen but the fact that she was able to use that to uh to her advantage and and to figure out how to maneuver with that past um it's i don't know it's it's fascinating to watch it mm-hmm. yeah i mean the whole thing opens with her in the speakeasy she's basically the waitress uh slash barmaid for her father in the speakeasy and she's being constantly you know felt up by men grabbed by men etc and she's tough she doesn't she doesn't take it basically um the the famous moment that i think has been gift to oblivion is where uh you know man puts his hand on her her bare knee and she like makes eye contact and pours an entire cup of hot coffee on his hand and on her knee like that's one of the things that is just so uh i think so well done that she like she does not give a shit that she's gonna get hurt at the same time it's just Mm -hmm. like i'm gonna do this and it's so tough like the in in the same scene um you know he tries to grab her he grabs her a couple of times she pours a bottle of beer for herself smashes the bottle over his head (laughs) and goes right back to drinking her beer like it's very cool but at the same time it's very reflective of this character who you're like this has happened to her numerous times and this and this has probably happened to her also with men that have not been put off by having a beer bottle smashed over their head Um, And so she has had to become tougher and stronger. And what she eventually learns is essentially is that, well, I have this power that men want and I'm going to use it to get the things that I want. And that's what a lot of the film actually focuses on. She starts out, you know, uh, after her father's death, she starts out, she goes into the city and she starts at the very bottom as it were and works her way up in the film and the film is very explicit about it like you literally see her kind of rising up in the building's hierarchy yeah Um, (laughs) she moves up floors quite literally and it's all based on her um her relationships with all these different men and then when the men begin to get sentimental or they begin to be like oh i love you i can't live without you she's just like i don't give a shit about you Mm -hmm. uh i i i am getting from you exactly what i want which is money and which is power and which is another step where i never have basically there's the undercurrent is uh that at a certain point maybe she will never have to do this ever again because she'll have money and she'll have power and she won't have to um uh just kind of use men constantly in order to get it uh it's for a film that it's a very short film but it focuses so much on her it's very much anchored to her as an actress and she threads a very fine needle because this character could have been very unlikable Mm -hmm. um and yet she isn't there there is like an inherent sympathy there is a humanity to her she's using people but she's she's that that's who she is you don't feel particularly hatred for her like oh what a terrible woman and the film doesn't produce that kind of attitude of like oh this is a terrible woman um all of these terrible things that she's doing in a lot of ways the men are doing it to themselves 
that's the thing. Like part of the reason that it's, um, it's easy to, um, uh, sympathize, I guess, with her is because she's not doing anything to anybody else that they're not trying to do to her too, you know, like maybe yeah. in a slightly different way, but like, they're trying to use her and she's trying to use them. Like it's, it's, yeah. you know, it's <laughs> honestly, it's mutually beneficial. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, it's exploitation. I mean, you know, yeah. there, there is this like, Oh, she, she is being exploited. She has been exploited since, since she was a teenager. And now she's like, I'm go- if the only thing that I have is my body and my, my, you know, being exploited, I'm at least going to exploit myself. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be, I'm going to use what I have to succeed. And that's yeah. precisely what she does. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the, the Hollywood ending because it's yeah. it's an it's one of those things that you're kind of like, yeah, this kind of is going to happen. At the same time, um, you know, so so she, she she eventually she eventually comes across a man who maybe does fall in love with her because that's what you do, uh, but he definitely clocks what she's up to. Mm -hmm. um and there's a really good scene the scene with the two of them when when they're in the boardroom she's talking with the bank board that she's she's basically been in the midst of this like love nest scandal where two men are now dead um she didn't kill either of them though (laughs) no they killed each other she's like well that was unfortunate (laughs) so she's she's been in the midst of the scandal and basically the the board of the bank was saying like this is not a good thing um is trying to figure out what to do with her and she's talking about going to the newspaper with her story right in order to to earn money she's written it all down in a diary (laughs) and she's smart (laughs) and there's this wonderful moment with and i'm trying to remember his name it's a fucking ridiculous character named Cortland trenholm (laughs) played by george not to be confused (laughs) with our friend Cortland, who was on the podcast a few months ago (laughs) Portland Trenholm is just that's that's quite a name for a guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it really is. Uh played by George Brent, uh perhaps one of the most boring of the 1930s leading men. <laughs> yeah, uh, I did not I couldn't pick him out of a lineup. <laughs> no, no one can. I don't think anyone I don't think anyone like every time he shows up I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's George Brent." Okay. <laughs> And he made a lot of films, like he, but he's just not not memorable. Uh, mm. And in this, he's not particularly memorable either, because he is at the end of the day, he is basically a function of her story. Yeah. Uh, but but they do it. This it's a great scene in the boardroom because you can see her manipulating and her kind of doing what we have seen her do numerous times throughout the film. And and then this moment where he clocks exactly what she's up to and use and manipulates it in such a way and like it's it's actually very good performances on both of their parts but particularly barbara stanwick because you see her like her eyes narrow her voice changes she's suddenly kind of sliding back to that kind of tough talking dame character and she's just like oh you fucking figured me out haven't you Mm -hmm. (laughs) um it's a great moment she's like all right i have to play this slightly differently i guess (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um but then ultimately you know he's the one that sort of makes her over as it were that she falls in love with him and she gives into sentiment and ultimately rather than like running away uh when he gets into trouble and so rather than her running away and abandoning him she comes back and she actually tries to like give him uh give him the money that he needs in order to to defend himself etc so it is very much a hollywood ending it's it's like oh isn't this this you know young woman that we have seen go through all of this she ends not you know moving on to the next man but actually staying with this one and actually you know feeling love and she just needed the right man so you do get that kind of impression from it uh so what what are your thoughts on that ending karen i'm still i'm still torn on it because i really like the idea of her character just getting to continue to live life on her own terms but finding some like stability and independence and not having to continue the lifestyle that she's mm-hmm. been living um being able to just kind of do her own thing but i also understand like the wanting to see a woman who's been through so much have some semblance of like 
like happiness, I guess, mm-hmm. at the end. So it's like I, I can understand both ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm still torn. In in a fair world, I feel like it's her and Chico going off and just living the high life for as long yeah. as they feel like it and enjoying themselves. Um, but, but that's also the 2020s world. That's absolutely. not the 1930s world. So it, so for the time period, it's like, yeah, it makes sense, I guess. But yeah, yeah. I would love to imagine that she went and lived a man-free life. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, absolutely. It is very much the, you know, the woman made over by love, but it is again, honest. And I I like there's, there's one scene where um, she becomes much more emotionally vulnerable with him. And, and she says that, you know, she would like to have misses on her tombstone. Yeah. And it's sad. It's such a sad statement because here's this woman who's like gone through all of these men who has used all of these men um, who's been used constantly and her one fantasy is I would like a man to have actually married me like that's mm-hmm. and and that's very sad and I think it's very empathetic it makes her very empathetic yeah um and and it does kind of reveal that none of this has been easy for her this isn't a you know she has learned to manipulate she's learned to use men but it's not a happy thing necessarily that she's doing she's not enjoying herself in a lot of ways and she does enjoy herself with him uh and so yeah that's that's the other i guess balance to it i still just want her and chico to go off to like europe and hang out in italy and just like have a string of gigolos parade (laughs) (laughs) definitely yeah i think though the one thing that does make portland um i had to think for a second what was his name (laughs) uh I think the one thing that does kind of they do well in making him sort of a match for her is that he is someone who has has traveled the world and has kind of seen and experienced a lot of other things. So he's not I think that's part of why she's drawn to him. And I think that they they do sell it pretty well um, because he's he hasn't just had the typical like experience of i grew up in this rich family and then one day i took over the bank you know i worked my way there and then i took it over it it, his experience and his life has been much different from that and i think that that's part of why she's drawn to him he's he's not like anybody else that she's Mm -hmm. that she's had to deal with yeah and he see and he does see her like that that scene Mm -hmm. in the boardroom where he he recognizes what she's up to so he sees her in a way that other men haven't yeah um and and that i think makes her makes him very attractive to her as well uh yes. yeah it's it's an inter- it's a very interesting film uh and and stanwick in particular like gives she is very very good at giving depth to characters that could so easily have no depth um and really making you feel for them and want them to succeed and i will say it is very, it would have been very easy in another era of filmmaking for this woman to be like horribly punished for, for what she's done. Um, and she isn't, she's actually kind of rewarded at the end. She gets love. She gets, you know, this, this connection with this man that she is perfectly happy to sacrifice for. It's not, she is not punished at the end and right. that's unusual. That's not going to happen in another couple of years in Hollywood either. Right. Yeah. So Babyface is available to stream on uh, Criterion Channel right now, and it is very worth watching if you have not seen it. Definitely. Uh, so moving on to a much later film. <laughs> so jump it ahead, like how many years? God, 16? No, 13. 13 years. 13 years later. 13 years later. Barbara Sarah returns in uh, The Strange Love of Martha Ivers. And this this is an this is an odd film i will say this is a film that for whatever reason it is available in like tons of public domain prints um apparently because the copyright holders forgot to renew the copyright on it and oh. so that's why if you can find you can watch this pretty much anywhere um do watch it in black and white not in there's some colorized versions uh, floating around including on uh, amazon that you do not do not watch this colorized it's First of all, it's hideous. Second of all, you lose so much of the depth of the photography. 
Um, but so this film stars uh, Barbara Stanwyck, Van Heflin, Elizabeth Scott, and Kirk Douglas in a, a film about three childhood friends who are accidentally on purpose involved in the murder of Barbara Stanwyck's aunt, uh, played by Judith Anderson, who has the briefest role on screen, but is great in it. <laughs> and everything kind of spirals out from that. And there's essentially you have Barbara Stanwyck and Kirk Douglas who play the grown up versions of these kids. Um, who it's the first a... film role for Kirk Douglas, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. And they've kind of been forced together. They're sort of trapped in this marriage together um, based upon their mutual guilt. And Van Heflin, who plays Sam Masterson, who is the third member of this triumvirate, returns to town completely on accident and, uh, and then winds up getting involved with the two of them again um, through a lot of different machinations. It's actually very confusing uh, and very odd how he sort of gets involved in their lives a second time. I, I want you to start on this, Ken. What are your thoughts on this film? Because I've seen it a couple of times and I go back and forth on it. Yeah, I um, I felt like it was a bit convoluted. <laughs> um, I, I enjoy the performances. I think that they all play really well together. Um, and there are definitely some things about it that I really liked. But overall, it's... Um, so you have this murder i don't i don't know <laughs> i don't know if it's if it's the next end or not it's never really clear to me um but i mean these are kids this this happens when they're kids and um and both of them suffer you know because of it in a lot of ways just because then she and she becomes a ward of his father in a weird way and and it turns out he's not the father isn't any nicer than her aunt was to her. So, so you really do see how they're victims of of circumstance, and you know they, similar to Babyface, like they just do the best they can, you know, mm -hmm. with with the life that was given to them. But when Sam comes back to town, and they're they think that he's known all along that they killed the aunt, mm -hmm. and. So when he comes back to town and, and he has no idea about any of this, but they don't know that he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this girl that he finds that he's super attracted to. And so he wants them to help her get out of her legal mess. It just, it just gets very messy and I was able to follow it, but I didn't necessarily think that it was very clean writing. <laughs> it was, it was, no. Uh, like I'm trying to be nice about it, but I guess everybody <laughs> involved is dead now, so I don't have to be. But <laughs> it, like it just it was too convoluted to really make me continue sustained caring about the, <laughs> about well, the story and the characters. It was very distracting. Yeah, I I agree with that. It spends an inordinate amount of time on Van Heflin and Elizabeth Scott, like their yeah. relationship, right? And there is this sensation that like, are is he really meant to be the star here? that mm -hmm. this is really his story, not the story of Martha Ivers, who is played by uh, Barbara Stanwyck. But Which the way that it ends, I would say it very much is intended to be Sam's story. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it should be. <laughs> well, and that's that's the thing, because the more interesting relationship and the more interesting characters really are um, Martha Ivers and Walter, uh, yeah. played by Kirk Douglas. Because, and that's, I think, where the film is strongest. And, you know, since this is about Barbara Stanwyck, um, that that you've got these two people who are kind of tied together because of guilt and not only have they did they participate in kind of the covering up of the aunt's death um mm -hmm. they also participated in the execution of someone right for the murder of the aunt which i think is it's that's that's the thing that feels unforgivable yeah um it isn't even like you know they the aunt is very much represented as being this horrible person who is abusive who's unkind to her her niece who like her niece constantly wants to run away from her and then the, this and she's a child right these are children yeah so you could almost excuse that but it's very difficult to excuse and now we're going to you know conspire to execute um a man for her murder who did not commit the murder and they know didn't commit the murder right and but they they convince themselves that it's okay because he was a criminal anyway 
Well, and that's the thing. What I really like about that that part of the story is that so much of it is about this kind of exponential building up of guilt mm-hmm. and how that guilt warps these people. And from the time that they are children, that like even before like the murder, they are already being warped by the situation that they find themselves in, by the manipulation of the adults around them and by the abusiveness of the society. Yeah. And and as they get older, they are continued, they continue to be manipulated by that. They continue to kind of be warped by that and, and destroyed by it. And again, you get Barbara Sandwick playing, playing a character who is not particularly sympathetic. Um, and there are sequences where you begin to wonder, does she actually kind of get off on murder? <laughs> um, but she has been so imprisoned by her own guilt and by the man who sh- who shares her guilt that it's hard not to feel for her that she uh, what she wanted was to be free she wanted to run off the way that sam does at the beginning of the film mm-hmm. and she can't she can't escape from it and that's really what destroys her and so i do think it's interesting at that level about this as a as a film about particularly a woman being entrapped in a society in which she cannot escape and it it destroys her from the inside out right yeah she's so wrecked with with a lot of guilt and trauma that she never got to deal with and ultimately she never gets to break free from that which if this had been pre or post code it's interesting uh to think to imagine how the ending might have been different but because this is in code times um obviously because of what they did there has to be a punishment for it and so she gets that at the end but it's like when it happens it doesn't i don't know for me it doesn't feel like the the it doesn't feel like justified you know it's like no she needs Mm -hmm. to be able to live and and face face what she's done and move on from it yeah, and, and the film definitely leaves both Martha and Walter trapped, uh, mm-hmm. trapped with each other, and and then ultimately ultimately leads to death. Right, um, partly because, well, mostly because they've they've gotten themselves. First of all, they do have this horrible secret, but um, but what they've done as a result, I mean, he's district attorney now, and he's running for reelection. She's you know, she inherited all of her aunt's money. So she's basically mm-hmm. the richest woman in town. It's the town is called Ivers town. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it's like they're, if they were to come clean and admit what happened, it would destroy everything. Like they, they can't win either way. You know, yeah. they either continue to live with the guilt or they fess up to it and lose like either way it's, it's an, it's, there's no getting out of it. There's no escape. Yeah, it, it's it's like I say it's, it's very much about that being trapped, and mm-hmm. I mean even being trapped by the name. the The whole film opens with you know Ivers Town. Yeah. She and she is Martha Ivers. She cannot leave. It's her town, literally. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it you know she's completely closed in on all sides, and it it warps her. It makes her that it's. I do give the film credit for showing that it isn't something inherent to her necessarily. It's the entire situation that she has to live in. Yeah. Um, that is what destroys her ultimately. That's what I think makes me really like this movie is the fact that um, even though she makes terrible choices, does some really bad things, I never feel like she's just this bad person. She... Just- yeah i mean she has a lot yeah. of, it's she is sympathetic but it's it's more than that it's 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 not just it's not just like oh i kind of see where she's coming from it's like no she actually in her way has tried to has tried to do good i guess <laughs> Be, like you know yeah. but obviously she can't she can't make up for what she's done but she tries to in mm-hmm. in certain ways and so i don't know i think that's i think that's a an interesting character study just right there well yeah yeah and there are a couple of scenes where she basically breaks down with with sam uh and i think there's the scene with them at the campfire 
mm-hmm. um and she essentially like she she has a she has a breakdown she's like i ca- i can't live like this basically i just wanted to leave but i couldn't yeah. um and it's very moving. And, and again, I think it speaks to, to Stanwyck's ability as an actress to really get at that, like you said, not just sympathy, but um, I don't know, emotional core, I guess, of, of this person and make the audience really understand her and why she is the way she is. Mm-hmm. She also does have like a moral center. Even though she made mm-hmm. bad choices, she did it, she did so for for reasons and some of those reasons are it just kind of happened and she didn't stop yeah. <laughs> it you know <laughs> and um and so it's like that's the thing she doesn't just not care it's which is why it really is eating her up why she's so trapped by it mm-hmm. and th- it's that level of depth that first of all stanwick really does a great job of of portraying but also i think it's credit to to the way this is written as well um to develop a woman that is complex and and because it could have been so easy to just turn her into a you know teenage serial killer (laughs) or something you know and they didn't go that route it wasn't that she takes joy in what happened she doesn't she doesn't not care about this man that was executed basically in her place um but but she's also not gonna give everything up to to do the right thing either yeah no i i definitely agree with that i like the complexity but i do think that and you put this in the notes too but i do think that overall the film spends way too much time with um sam and and the the girl that he meets the girl yeah well i I came out thinking of her as elizabeth scott (laughs) who i'm sorry like i she had a long career she 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 did quite well but I to me she's always just a a bargain version of Lauren Bacall like that's all I can think oh as soon as I saw her I was like wait is that Lauren Bacall (laughs) no that's not (laughs) I'm sorry she just doesn't do it for me (laughs) no um so speaking speaking of women with a lot of strange complexity (laughs) and yet are not very likable but also kind of are uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sorry wrong numbers uh, this is this is the a 1948 so this is two years after uh the search of martha ivers um this is a 1948 and it's it's built as a, a thriller film noir and i think that this one definitely qualifies as a noir in a lot of ways yeah, yeah. um directed by anatole litvak and based uh from a screenplay by lucille fletcher and it is also based on her radio play of the same name um, and uses the same kind of structure as the the radio play, except that the radio play is very much a one woman show. Um, it's about a a, a a bedroom, a quote bedridden invalid, um, who <laughs> overhears on cross lines on a telephone, overhears the plot of a murder, uh, and tries to decipher what is what is going to happen and eventually comes to the conclusion that she is in fact the intended victim so the this film is is so this one was written was also written by lucio fletcher and it massively expands on the kind of one woman single location concept uh of the original radio play to to good and ill i mean i think that there's there's a lot of um there's some stuff that I think could have been pared down a great deal, but it's a really interesting kind of attempt to adapt what is a very small and claustrophobic story to something that is a little bit broader without losing a lot of the claustrophobia, particularly again in Stanwyck's performance. Mm-hmm. I just so, have to ahead. say, um, I, I was kind of telling you this yesterday, but <laughs> it's really funny because I had seen this movie years ago. And then one day, I was flipping the channels and I saw dial M for murder was, was on. And I was like, Oh, I love this movie. I'm going to watch it. And I started watching it and I was like, wait, none of this looks familiar. Where's the wife in bed? And where's, (laughs) I had totally mixed up. (laughs) Sorry, wrong number and dial M for murder, which are very different stories, (laughs) but also not, (laughs) but also not. And I was just like, where's, where's Grace? like grace kelly she wasn't in this and yeah anyway it was very confusing but uh yeah um but sorry wrong number is it's a fun one i think that uh i think it would be interesting 
to see how it could have worked if they had let it really be mostly the one yeah. woman show. Like I think about movies that are made now, um, movies like searching and missing, which uh, are very, they're kind of in the same universe. They're not by the same people, but they're in the same universe where everything is through, um, through screens. And it's mm-hmm. all about like, you know, FaceTime and looking at through a through a surveillance camera and stuff like that and how it's like you have a person that's in one location trying to solve this mystery with whatever resources are available to them and I just think oh this could have been so fun to see that in 1940s you know yeah uh to see that play out with someone who really does only have a party line <laughs> to to work <laughs> with you know yeah it's 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 interesting because it's so dependent on the technology of the period. Like you couldn't Mm -hmm. have this, you couldn't have this exact story anymore um, because that's just not how telephones work. (laughs) Exactly. You know, landlines, all of that stuff. But it does have a great deal of affinity with uh, those other films that that you're talking about. The, um, the, the, the FaceTime, the FaceTime uh, computer, et cetera, where it's all being told through, various images on a computer and very often you only have a single character who's then interacting with people that exist outside of the space right and this happens somewhat in in sorry wrong number where when she hears this this conversation then she's trying to get the operator to connect her back she's trying to like get some like she's calling people trying to trying to get somebody to listen to her talk about what has what she's heard and trying to help her break it down but then it goes into these other other i guess um scenes where yeah it's other people telling their stories which i think in in some ways it's good like when she finally gets uh the one woman on the phone i'm blinking on her name right now oh Um, the ex the ex-girlfriend yeah uh sally sally when she finally gets sally on the phone and sally's telling the story about this like shack in staten island and stuff and um and so seeing that it makes sense because it is kind Mm -hmm. of it's playing out her telling the experience of what she saw but i think that it could have been more interesting if they had limited some of that like maybe not shown so much of what her husband was doing and and who he was meeting with and if if more of that had yeah. been left to the imagination yeah i i think that you get you even get flashbacks within flashbacks so you yeah. get the the wendell Corey character who's the doctor um telling her about like oh well i talked with your husband about this and then you get like a flashback of him talking with the husband and then you get a flashback of the husband and and it's like <laughs> okay from whose perspective is this really being told because it should be told from her perspective right because right. she's the one that's listening to all of this but it feels a little bit more distanced than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think that the film could have still managed to do that while also really focalizing more through her. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that what they do with the story is very much about trying to make it more cinematic because the the concept, definitely in the 1940s, the concept of we're going to have this woman alone in a room talking on the telephone for you know yeah how do you sell that (laughs) an hour and a half right and i do think that you can sell it uh i think that it it would be a harder sell in in 1948 than it it is in like 2023 um but i do think that they they could have sold it and it would have put so much pressure in a lot of ways on barbara sandwick herself uh because Mm -hmm. she would have to anchor all of it even though you would have external voices and and things like that that being said, I do think that what they do is good and it's entertaining. Um, but the best parts of the film are kind of her falling apart, increasingly falling apart over the course of this night as she realizes that she is that she's the intended victim. Yeah. Um, and is is trying to find a way to get help. Uh the the other element that I think that is is that what they're attempting to do is they're also attempting to make her more sympathetic and to show more of her relationship with her husband and how it's kind of fallen apart in a lot of ways 
um, and why it's fallen apart. And so we get more of that and like their past together, her father, um, her illness, all of those things. And that stuff I do like. It's interesting backstory. It's interesting character development. And and it really does kind of add to the tension at the end as as her husband suddenly, you know, is desperate to to get her out of the situation too because he's realizing like oh whoops i screwed up this is really bad <laughs> and uh um but by that point there's nothing they can do about it well you know it makes him more sympathetic too yeah. and i think that that's kind of an interesting approach uh to that character because rather than seeing kind of it all being filtered exactly through her we're also getting their backstory and how and why he would reach this point where <laughs> Yeah. He's trying to kill her <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah it's it's totally true because like he could have just been a guy that if we didn't know his side of the story then he looks like a philanderer who's taking advantage of her for her money and but because we know what really has happened and the fact that he never wanted to work for her father and he kind of got he got trapped in this situation these movies are all about being trapped um and he got trapped <laughs> yep. in this situation and um and but also it's not that she ever necessarily wanted to trap him like that wasn't really her goal but they just never really had any honest conversations either of them about how they were really feeling and what was really at stake and what was really going on with them and what they wanted and Mm -hmm. so this is just kind of where they ended up and yeah there is an, an interesting level of sympathy for both of them because of it yeah yeah definitely you know it's it's interesting thinking about the uh, the single location kind of filmmaking the film rope uh directed by my beloved alfred hitchcock comes mm-hmm. out the same year so it is also 1948 and now that's that's a relatively small cast it's not one person in a room right right but it's it's interesting that already at this period that you be that filmmakers like hitchcock are playing with this concept of the single location um, and that creation of claustrophobia, et cetera. So it's a different kind of cinema in a lot mm-hmm. of ways, because very often I think what Sorry, Wrong Number does is that it tries to make the story that's a radio story more cinematic. Yeah. Uh, but I, I also think that if they could have pushed it a little bit and been like, we can make the single location, single in person, um, having conversations on the telephone into a cinematic narrative. Uh, yeah. and, and I don't necessarily like Anatole Litvak is, is a fantastic filmmaker. So I'm not at all saying that like, oh, Hitchcock would have done it better, but maybe Hitchcock would have done it better. <laughs> <laughs> it it would have, it feels like it's a chance for an experiment that, um, maybe they just simply could not do, but would have been so interesting if they did. I really would love to know. And I, I didn't do enough research on this before we started recording but i really would love to know how much the studio was involved in the final the final cut and the final like in the script and everything because this definitely feels like it got a lot of notes of we need to see more of burt lancaster we need to see more you know whatever just yeah like like studio interference might have been part of the reason that it's not more experimental well, and I, I think that it's a hard it's a hard sell, definitely. And and Hitch, Hitchcock, when it comes to things like Rope or Dial in for Murder or Lifeboat, he gets away with it in part because he's Alfred Hitchcock and that's his name, yeah. right? It's a very hard sell to also to say to someone like, oh, we're going to have Burt Lancaster, but we're only ever going to hear his voice. Right. <laughs> um, we're going to have, you know, these actors, but we're never actually going to see them. The only person we're going to see is, is Barbara Stanwyck. Mm-hmm. Um, I think she could have been sold on <laughs> Oh yeah, but uh, and I I think that given what I what I've seen of, of her as an actress, I think that she would have been fascinating. Um, but I think it's a harder thing to sell both to to an actor, but also to the studio itself. So yeah, you're mm-hmm. you're probably right. It does feel like it does feel like one of those things that the studio probably even when they commissioned this were like, this is what we want. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a fun movie. It's a lot of fun. It really and Barbara is. Str- yeah. Barbara Stanwyck is great. So. yeah and again you know the the kind of through line that we're running through like you said films about people being trapped um and and with her films about inherently unsympathetic characters made sympathetic by her performance mm-hmm. uh and and that in itself like her breakdown 
I almost want to go back and watch the film just for the scenes in which she appears, like no flashbacks, et cetera, but just her in the bedroom. Um, yeah. And the progression of her breakdown as she realizes what is happening and how isolated she is and how much danger she is in. And particularly the final sequence where we actually get the murders and the buildup to that is so good and so well shot and so well acted, it's terrifying. Um, and it really embeds the viewer, I think, in her fear and how she would be, the, she would be someone, she can't move, she can't scream, she can't do anything. Uh, it's really quite a devastating ending in a lot of ways. It is, yeah. Because you, like, you still have that hope of like, someone's gonna burst in at the last minute and save her and it doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah and that's that's a choice too i mean they, they yeah. could have gone for a more quote hollywood ending here and they don't um and i think that it makes it very effective mm -hmm. yeah absolutely but i i just realized i, I noted here burt lancaster never stood a chance <laughs> just like yep <laughs> you married a barbara stanwick sorry about that bra <laughs> no man stands a chance with barbara stanwick but so. he just inherited a bunch of money from her so he's fine Except for he's well, probably going to prison. He's get he's about to get arrested. <laughs> so but and... now he can afford lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> he's about to get arrested. He may, I mean, who the hell knows? Given the number of people she's been calling around saying, like, hey, I overheard a murder plot and she's gonna turn up dead, obviously murdered. Like, I do kind of wonder whether he's gonna get caught up in that as well. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think Burt Lancaster ends this all happily either. Yeah, probably to be not. <laughs> uh, so Sorry Wrong Number is is available on a couple of different streaming services, including... Um, I watched it on Pluto. I was going to say Pluto. I think it's also on Tubi and a couple of others. So and available, available to be viewed and uh, highly recommended. And also... I really recommend getting a hold of the script of the original radio play, which I remember reading back in high school. It's fantastic. It's so well structured. Um, if you can hear any of the audios, I think Agnes Moorhead played the part originally on the radio. Um, any of the audios of the performances of this play, it, it's such a well-made story. Mm -hmm. um, even if you know everything, it's just, it builds the tension so well. It's a fantastic, fantastic story. Yeah. So good. Very rewatchable. Yes. Uh, so any final thoughts on Barbara Stanwyck? Um, she's Thesa? awesome and beautiful <laughs> and watch all of her movies. She's she's quite she's quite a force of nature on screen. She really is. Uh, it's so true. Yeah. And, and like I say, has been in, did a whole bunch of screwball comedies and is hilarious in them um and kind of brings that sort of tough dame ethos to to so much of what she does so highly recommend barbara stanwick yes. uh so that is going to close us out for our first noir member episode uh thank you so much everybody for listening to us and as always we want to thank our lovely patrons who continue to support us and uh and yeah I give us love and everything so thank you so much to ali brian connor estefania heather james judy karen cariata lauren matt michelle monty nanina robert robert steve sharon and tau thank you so much for supporting us guys and um if you want to join their number our patreon is patreon.com slash citizen dame you get uh Bon you get episodes early, you get bonus episodes. We're going to be doing a bonus episode on Blood Simple this month, um, which I am really fucking excited about because I love Blood Simple. <laughs> so uh, thank you for suggesting this, Karen. I am so excited about it. Well, you had mentioned that you picked it up in your Criterion Hall, and then I was at Barnes & Noble yesterday, and I was like, okay, I'm allowed. I'm allowing myself to buy two movies <laughs> right now. I'll probably get more before the sale ends, but two today is, is all I'm allowed. And I Blood Simple was there and I was like, I've been wanting to buy this. So I got that one. And then I thought, wait, Lauren just got this too. I have an idea. <laughs> it, it is a fantastically rewatchable film too. Yes. Like just so good. I've seen it a couple of times and I'm just like, I just enjoy this. Like I like <laughs> it, the experience of watching this movie. So I'm yeah. very, yeah, I, I think we're quite excited about, mm -hmm. uh, about doing Blood Simple. So you would get that if you're a patron. Um, you also get like stickers and buttons and fun things and, uh, and 
you know, and you get to support us too and, and pay help us to pay the bills here. Uh, so that's our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash citizen dame. We also do have a Zazzle store, zazzle.com slash citizen dame pot and a Ko-Fi account, co-fi.com slash citizen dame. You can check out our website where we do have links to episodes as well as reviews and editorials and stuff like that. That's citizen dame pod.com. And if you want to get in touch with us, we're all over the place. We, our email is citizennamepod at gmail.com. We are also on uh, Instagram and Blue Sky at Citizen Dame Pod. Not really on Twitter no more. Uh, I think our account is still on there, but I don't think we've posted to it in quite a while. Yeah, um, he hasn't stolen and sold it yet. So <laughs> Yeah, I'm waiting for my, my personal one to get stolen and sold as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Best place to to follow us and to get in touch with us as well is our letterbox uh, at Citizen Dame. We have links to all of the episodes. Uh, we have Citizen Dame HQ where there's all kinds of fun things, including lists. And also, if you're on Letterbox, you can join us and Martin Scorsese. So yes, definitely. And you know you want to be in a club with Martin Scorsese. Yes, definitely. Uh, so yeah, definitely check us out on letter on Letterbox. <laughs> And of course, you could get in touch with us individually. Karen, where are you? I am on Instagram, Letterboxd, and well, all the things, Blue Sky at Karen M. Peterson. And I am also on all the things at LH Business. So I think that will close us off for this week. We will talk to y'all later. Bye. Isn't this cozy? You know, sometimes your little girl gets awful lonesome here all by herself. Oh, my dear. Hey, Louis, woman. I wish you'd get rid of that fantastic colored girl. No, Chico stay. All right, all right, all right. Uh, how would you like to have a nice grand piano in this room? Eh? Thanks, no pianos. I used to hear one all day long. Why, did somebody in your home play the piano? Anybody that had a nickel. Hmm? Oh. oh, I was only kidding. Oh. <laughs> of course, the fuzzy wuzzy really wants to give me something. He could put a few more pennies in my bank account.